March 15th meeting, the Oklahoma City Water Utilities Trust will be in order, and the first item on the agenda is the uh, approval of minutes for the March 1st meeting. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second to approve the March 1st minutes. Are there corrections, additions? Hearing none, voting please. Minutes are approved. Next item is the consent docket. Move the consent docket subject to individual consideration. Second. Motion and a second to approve the consent docket subject to individual consideration. Are there items to be considered? individually hearing none voting please consent dockets approved the next item is a concurrence docket there's one item second motion has second to approve the sole item on the concurrence doctor their questions comments Voting, please. Concurrence dockets approved. Next item. Item five is items for individual consideration, and the first item is the professional service agreement concerning the management, operation, and maintenance of wastewater treatment facilities at all. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Harry Sultani, our wastewater treatment superintendent, call it wastewater quality superintendent is with us this afternoon to give you just a, a couple of minutes background information on the contract. Good afternoon. Uh, this is for considering approval of service agreement with several entrants for uh, operation and maintenance of uh, wastewater facilities. Second. And if you could put that in slide, yeah. <laughs> please. Our uh, current service agreement provides operation and maintenance of the wastewater treatment plants and the nature pump station, the solids management, industrial prepayment program, and reuse program. It ends December 31st, 2016. The new service agreement generally is uh, the same as the current one. Uh, it uh, provides for operation and maintenance of the wastewater treatment plants and ritual pump station, solids management. I'm oh, sorry, you're oh, <laughs> looking. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the same, sorry, but uh, the same as the current one, if it's strengthened. Uh, Uh, the strengthened service requirement, strengthened performance standards, and the uh, staffing level is increased to 85. It includes transition plan, reduction in fee for non-compliance, and a letter of credit for $3 million. Next, please. The transition uh, starts from award of the contract through December 2016. Operation start date is January 1st, 2017. Completion date is December 31st, 2021 for five years. And it can be renewed for two additional five years. The initial one m cost is $10.88 million with the electrical component, $2.35 million for a total cost of $13,235,211. Next, please. And with that, the uh, general manager recommends the service agreement be approved, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And trustees, we have uh, representatives from uh, Southern Trent present in the audience. If you, if you would like to visit with them, uh, staff again is happy to answer questions about the proposed contract. Any questions at all? I think uh, I see representatives from the proposer from the from the recommended uh, operator are here and uh, 
I just want to reiterate what a step of faith this is, uh, under all, given all the circumstances, to do this. I, I think you have a, a big responsibility, uh, and uh, operating this contract is not one that, uh, as I'm sure you know from previous experience, is not one that's uh, always a bed of roses. Uh, sometimes there are things that happen that are beyond your control. Sometimes there are things that we can control that have to be dealt with quickly. We're experiencing one of those right now concerning the land application. And uh, we don't fault uh, the current operator for that, but um, it is something that's going to be more and more um, important as time goes on that we make sure that we maintain those kind of things in the best way possible to have with the lowest impact we can possibly have on the citizens. So I know we've had this conversation face to face and I, but I, uh, I just want to reiterate my feelings about it. And I think I should trust the chair's my, my views on it. Any other questions? That wasn't a question. That was a sermon, wasn't it? Yeah. I move the item. Second. And most second to approve the contract. All in favor vote. This contract approved. Next item is a report on the 10 year capital plan financing strategy. So, uh, the financial advisor has prepared a report, and Brett Lankart is going to go over the highlights. Uh, Mr. Chairman and trustees. The, the current letter of credit program is set to either expire or be renewed August 1st of this year. In advance of that, since we had already done the cost of service fee adjustments for the funding of the CIP for the three-year period, we thought it was important to have our financial advisor review the various ways the CIPs could be financed so they could bring to you the best recommendations on how to go forward for the next 10 years. And they looked at the CIP that we had planned out for the 10-year plan and came back and recommended that we continue with the CP program and the pay-as-you-go financing with one change, and that's because of the fact that we now have been upgraded by Moody's. We now are at the AAA rating for both S&P Moody's. We can migrate from a direct pay letter of credit to a standby letter of credit, which just basically relies more on our credit and less on the credit provider, the letter of credit provider. So therefore, we can get a better deal because the market has changed since we went out for our current letter of credit and the fees are higher for the direct pay than they are for the standby and we can now do that with our credit rating. They also recommend that we migrate from 150 million to 275 million now and that in two years we consider going to 375 as the construction window is in the midst of the uh, Atoka pipeline phase and that's where we, we concurrently will be adding more projects outstanding at the same time and we'll need that additional capacity, not necessarily to pay claims, but to be able to award the projects under state law. We have to either have the cash in hand or a provision therefore, and according to bond council, the provision therefore is met by us having this agreement in place with State Street for the letter of credit. So, so that's what they've basically done, is, is done the analysis, and those are the recommendations uh, in the summary. We can ask her any questions. We're happy to do so. Any questions? Does this does this change mean that we'll be able to operate uh, uh, more economically? What prior to us going to letter credit finance, and we used to have to borrow the money in advance and say we would borrow 80 to 100 million dollars and it would take two to three years to complete the work, we were having to pay interest on that money from day one in order to have the provision therefore clause met of having the financing in place in order to award. So we were paying interest, let's say five, six, seven percent, or in today's market, four percent, let's say, yet on a letter of credit, we can borrow the money for a half a percent or less so, so it's far more economical for us to avoid having to pay that interest during construction. So we can now borrow the money on each claim as we pay the claim, rather than all up 
front. And what we're avoiding is what's called negative arbitrage. We're avoiding millions of dollars of interest payments until we actually need the money. And that has made it so that we're saving about one half percent per year in fees that we would have had to raise rates if we didn't have a letter of credit financing, according to our analysis before we went to them. So over the long term, it ought to have a positive impact on right payers. Yeah, it already has when we went to it. And by this program in place, it will continue to do so even to a greater extent because the CIP for the next 10 years is about twice as large per year as the one we just went out of the last five years. Unless we can find a way to take advantage of the negative interest rate environment we're in and have people pay us to borrow money. Right. And that may happen at some point, so right. we should keep our options open. Right. Any other questions? Uh, do we, we need a motion to receive the report, I guess. Is that I move we receive the report. Second. And there is a resolution. And, and there is a resolution as part of it, too. And yes, there's, there's two parts. There's a resolution as right. well. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Voting, please. Report receiving the resolution is approved. Thank you. Next item is items from trustees. Anybody have a comment? Hearing none. Next item is general manager's report, which is a presentation concerning seismic activity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with us today is from Smith Roberts Baldesweiler is Carl Baldesweiler, and from his Please, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Trustees. Uh, please make this presentation this afternoon on recent seismic activity and its effect on engineering design. Uh, Tom Crowley with Crollo Engineers has worked with us on this project, and he will make this presentation at this time in 10 minutes or less. 10 minutes or less, huh? <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, Trustees. Thanks for allowing me to be here today. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. We're going to go over a few definitions, talk about the recent seismic activity we've all experienced, show you how it uh, taken into account in our designs, um, and it's a few takeaways for you um, to, to kind of calm everybody down about the seismic activities. Because as designers, it's really near and dear to our heart, and we want to make sure that our designs are very robust. So we took some time to look at some recent earthquakes that you had in the area and kind of translated it into what if that earthquake were experienced with our designs. And we want to show you what the response was. So definitions, um, it's very important to us uh, to, to differentiate between induced seismic activity and natural occurring seismic events, simply because induced seismic, uh, seismic events can occur um, not along natural fault lines. Right? They can occur anywhere where man-made activities are, are, are undergone. Uh, you'll see that reflective in a couple of maps I'm going to show you. Uh, so recent, you know, in the past, most of the seismic activity in Oklahoma is centered around fault lines, around the natural fault lines located mainly in the south, southwest, and, and southeastern portions of the state. But on, re recently, as illustrated by these blue dots, we've seen a lot of increased seismic events where we hadn't seen them before. Um, they tend to come in very low, uh, low magnitude, but come in quote unquote swarms. Okay, so quite a few occurring here and there. Some we feel, some we don't. And this is illustrated by USGS's induced seismicity event and conclusions that were drawn uh, in 2014-2015. Uh, you can see there was quite a few earthquakes recently, more recently, rather than um, rather than uh, in the past. So, you know, taking a look at just a basic earthquake model is 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 basically this uh, glass of water. The uh, acceleration is represented by the glass. So this is the seismic event. The water inside the glass is represented by the structure. So the structure has to take up that that movement that is caused by the seismic accelerations. So illustrated it, the stiff and short glass uh, will be much more uh, in tune with the seismic movements than a tall and flexible structure. So the phrase, 
for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the taller structure is absorbing much more up high than a shorter, stiffer structure. So we want to look at both the acceleration and the reaction. And one of the classic uh, design uh, events was the one that everybody remembers occurred while you were watching the Giants uh, Dodgers World Series in 1989. Ace. Huh. Oakland. Yeah, Oakland. Yes. It, sorry, Oakland in 1989. Yes, it, and the earthquake occurred during that period. Uh, so, what there were a couple of structures that were very important that they had monitored. One was Treasure Island and one was Yerba Buena Island, okay? And both of these have different ground conditions. So the response of the ground is also very important. The rocky bedrock that was at Yerba Buena experienced much less of a response than the soft soils that you saw at Treasure Island. And that has been used uh, to map accelerations uh, throughout the United States, that type of analysis. So there are actually two ways to measure how intense an earthquake is at the site. The first one is to use seismic maps and just kind of estimate what, how severe those accelerations might be. And the other one is to use actual events and do programming to determine what the accelerations are at site. So the first one is what we use in our designs. Uh, the reason why is you know, you never know when an earthquake is going to happen. You never know how frequent it is. So what they do is they first look at the most damaging earthquakes, like the one with the Oakland and, and Dodger World Series. That was a pretty damaging one. They cite those on the site. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I've, I've got Kirk Gibson's home run, run in my head. The locations. Uh, so then they, they kind of map the smaller earthquakes and factor those in. And then they look at the intensity of those earthquakes, how intense were they, how impactful were they over the region. And then finally, they'll look at the frequency, uh, you know, what the return period is estimated. And they put all that together in a model to create seismic acceleration maps that we use in our designs. Well, what we were fortunate enough to do, uh, the, one of the very important things is that due seismicity is not included in these maps. So, you know, as you can see, the, the, the parts of the state, uh, some of them are much less intense, and the induced seismic events are occurring in those. So what we, what we were able to do is we take a look at uh, our most recent event that the o Oklahoma uh, Geological Society, our survey, had done. And they had actually monitored um, some, placed out some monitoring equipment near Arcadia Dam. And what it did is it recorded um, some of the uh, seismic accelerations that were felt uh, during that earthquake in Prague uh, in 2011. And so they've done a whole study uh, about this earthquake. And it's very interesting. I'll come back to the church a little bit later. But remember that tall, flexible structure? Well, our, si our structural engineer joked that, you know, this the last place that you really want to go in, in an old town to take shelter from an earthquake is a church because typically they're the highest structure and they're the least reinforced because they're the oldest structure. So one of the other things that we did is we took a look at that data and said, okay, what if we were designing to that earthquake? I mean, how does that match up to what, our, what, we, what we would design for? So we went through uh, basically the same type of model that was used to create the seismic acceleration maps and just basically generated a seismic acceleration at the site and kind of brought it and normalized it to the map data. So we get to see in this how that acceleration map compares of that actual earthquake to what we're using in our designs. And the interesting part of it is you can see these blue lines down below, the one on the the one that uh, that's on your left is a softer soil, okay, which has a, a much higher acceleration response rate, like that uh, Yorba, that island over there, the soft soil island. Um, the blue line represents the actual earthquake. The green line represents what we designed today. 
So the fact that we're taking into account much higher accelerations and much higher uh, uh, should give us a, a, a great bit of comfort, okay, that we're designing to a much greater standard than what we are experiencing now with this induced seismicity. Um, with, the, uh, with the soils that are uh, more like Treasure Island soils or rocky soils, we're actually a little bit uh, just the, the difference is not as much because of the stiffness of this soil. But if you look at the accelerations that end up being, uh, they're much higher within the soft soils than they're, in, they're within the, uh, the rocky soil. So what the point of this is, is to say that, hey, even though we're, uh, we're just, we're closer, we're not, we're still, the seismic accelerations are not that great because we're on rock. So for all soil types, we looked at it. There's a number of different ones. There's like six or seven. We looked at all soil types, and for all soil types, we were much more conservative in our current designs than any sort of acceleration that you might expect from uh, an induced seismic event, okay? So for all site classes, all soil classes, our building codes currently are greater than those recommended by the OGS site-specific study. So our, our accelerations that we're using in our building code designs are very robust and they're very conservative. Another thing that, I, that OGS mentioned was the uh, response of the structures, and that has to do with more the, you know, the fact that we're seeing a lot of them. We're seeing swarms of earthquake. How does that structure respond repeatedly to that movement? As you can see, the churches in, in St. Gregory didn't survive very well because it's this tall and unreinforced structure. So what we do when we go look at the building codes is we place, we place risk factors. So a category one is a pretty low risk factor. We don't really care how that structure responds other than maybe it needs to stay up so people can get out. Uh, for code four, that's the hospitals. They have to take repeated events and still stay in operation. Much like water and wastewater facilities, uh, most particularly the, the category four that you're concerned with are mostly your storage tanks for fire, fire flow. Uh, most of the piping and all of the stuff associated with the fire flow analysis, that's the most important to place uh, as conservative factor on. So that deals with repeatability. Power generation stations, water treatment plants, we apply these additional factors on top of those accelerations. So a, a much more conservative design. Because what we're taking into account is the level of operability. Can that operator go in there and operate the water treatment plant, produce water? Uh, can that pump station and that tank stay uh, under a repeated seismic event, stay viable and operational? So we, we also looked at that, and our conclusions were that based on what we have been seeing in the area, based on the level of conservatives uh, that we have in both the seismic acceleration maps and the factors that we apply to them because of the, the, the fact that we need to keep these structures operational, is that we have a very robust design as engineers today. Uh, it's about to get more robust as you adopt the 2012 codes those seismic acceleration factors actually get higher. And I think, um, talking to structural engineers, I think it's a lot of a response to our, us being conservative and making sure that induced seismic events, even though they cannot be predicted, uh, that that is placed into consideration by the seismic acceleration maps. So that uh, pretty much uh, concludes the presentation. But what I want you to take away from today is that we simulated some of the earthquakes around here. We've seen how our structures and our designs respond to those. It doesn't seem to be any cause for concern. We're very conservative, uh, both in the, the magnitude and both in the rep repetition uh, of the earthquakes. So with that, thank you. And, uh, am I 2.30? I'm done. Outside of not knowing what, what World Series that was, <laughs> when did you start using the term induced? That's always been around because I think a lot of the, uh, even in back in the, the 70s, they were, really? they were inducing earthquakes. 
but not to the frequency and the extent of which they've been, we've been doing today. A lot of it had to do with um, um, sometimes, the, you know, injection wells will do something locally. When we do RO concentrate wells, we have to. I just never seen that. I mean, I guess the difference is somebody like you producing it and the oil company producing it. Yeah. Like, well, I, it's just the magnitude of the scale of uh, the, the deep well injection that's occurring right. is, is uh, you know, if you're, if you're pricking it once, it's maybe not a big deal. But if you're pricking it five or ten right. or fifty times, then you're putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the underground. Uh, Have any of the, the earthquakes in Oklahoma ruptured water, uh, water lines? In ground transmission. Not line. to my, not to my knowledge. Nothing directly related. Uh, that could be directly related to it. Mm -hmm. Typically, those are much more safe because they're low right. and they're in the ground. Um, when we design, you know, I mean, we're, we're predominantly some some of our designs in California will account for seismic faults where we know an earthquake is going to happen. So what we do is we naturally put some flexibility in the pipeline to take that take that up, but. When you don't know where the fault line is and you don't know when it occurs, it becomes more, more difficult to anticipate. I have a question. In your analysis, did, is there any indication that earthquakes occur more often certain times of the year, or is it just? Yeah, not, not that we could see. Okay. You know, we couldn't tie it to any sort of, neither could uh, the, the, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey. So. Yeah, that nothing has been tied to a particular time of year yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I don't believe there's anything else to come before us. No citizens to be heard. We're adjourned. Thank you.